sometimes people ask you like what a book what a book is about and you don't like to answer that question. It's, it's about, I don't know, about 180,000 words. Is that the Samuel Delaney joke? But, um, but so, so basically the, the protagonist, Rebecca, right, is married to an experimental physicist, um, Philip, who is working on a project that is some, somewhat like a time machine, but not exactly. And the book covers a time period from, like, say, the mid-1990s to the unspecified near future. Um, and so part of the uh, material involves the sort of the, the evolution of social media over time. And so the part that I settled on to read is a bit from what is, like, a little bit, a couple of years before our present day when Rebecca is making her first forays into online dating and she's set up a profile and uh, and she's seeing what's going to happen. So I'm going to read for about 15 minutes or so. <clears throat> After I open the water. A couple of days later, working on and off, she got in the profile as good as she could get it. She listed a selection of books she liked that would make her look smart but not egg-headed. She said she loved to laugh, trite but true, and everyone else was saying it, so she didn't want to seem like the girl who sits in the corner at a party with a frown on her face. She said she liked peace and quiet, but also the energy of clubs or a night in the city. She'd scattered a few emoticons through her text, even though using them made her feel like a failure when it came to using the English language. But again, all the other women were doing it, and she didn't want to seem humorless. She said she loved a nice glass of wine. For some reason, she found it difficult to express herself like she could have in an email or even a text message. There was some intangible thing about the site itself that made everyone seem sort of the same. It wasn't that they were boring exactly. If anything, people were always going on in their dating profiles about how they were the exact opposite of boring, even as they all listed the same five things they wouldn't be able to do without in life. <laughs> But they weren't nearly as interesting in their descriptions as they would probably be if you had met them by chance out in the world. It was as if the questions that were meant to serve as conversation starters worked in set stead to make everyone seem equally bland and anonymous. Once Rebecca started getting messages from guys, and it took about three days for them to start arriving in force, she started to understand why the profiles of some of the women she'd looked at before she filled out her own were so bizarrely defensive. Surely it would have been easier not to have her profile on lovability in the first place than to spend thousands of words describing the kinds of guys you didn't want to talk to. Let me just state this right up front before you start reading about me because I did not want to waste your valuable time. Do not message me if you're over 35, if you're married, if you're just looking to have a good time because I'm not a good time girl. If you're not 5'11 or taller, if you're not white, I am not racist, my parents did not raise me that way. If you're not living in your own place or with your own job or if you cannot write real sentences in real English without using the F word or the B word or the C word. If the men's profiles were generally unappealing to Rebecca on first glance, with a photo from a senior prom, the guy's date cropped out of the image except for a disembodied bracelet-clad arm draped across his shoulder, or a shot taken by pointing a phone's camera at a bedroom mirror, one hand lifting up the hem of a sleeveless t-shirt to, to reveal a scrupulously maintained six-pack, then the messages they sent were truly awful. <laughs> They seem to have been written by men who had learned what little they knew of women by watching James Bond movies through a scrim made of cheesecloth. <laughs> there were nonsensical gruntings and the F and the B and the C meant Rebecca was sure with endearment. The messages that were longer and more coherent either showed signs of being sent en masse to every new woman who showed up on the site or were mistakes made by guys who probably had multiple browser windows open. It was news to Rebecca, for instance, that she wore eyeglasses. And it was further news that for some guys, girl with glasses, girls with glasses was like a thing. <laughs> hey, you're really hot. Ever since I was a kid, I have fetish for girls with bad eyesight. I like to think about when we were in bed together and I take her glasses off and hide them and it's dark and she can't see and she gets a little scared. <laughs> Would you tell me your prescription? I am minus four in both eyes. You look like you're at least minus five, which is super hot. 
Then there were the guys who must have been watching reality shows about pickup artists on cable and thought it would be a good idea to leave with an insult. Don't take this the wrong way. I don't mean to be critical, but I can tell from your profile that you really think you're hot shit. Arrogant and pretentious too, but I like that in a woman. You aren't going to find many guys around here who are willing to deal with arrogance. I'm going to go out on a limb and predict that with an ad attitude like yours, you haven't had much success on the site so far. If you want to try to convince me that you're something other than what I think you are, reply to this message and we'll talk. But you probably won't like right back. I know what I couldn't nerve. And yet the whole experience was somehow compelling. If you could keep in mind that what people were communicating with wasn't you, but a stripped down version of yourself, a little marionette made out of data, then the things that other people said to your puppet became amusing rather than insulting, and the act of puppetry became a game instead of something that mattered. Once you got it straight in your head, the whole thing became, in a weird way, fun. Eight days after opening her profile, Rebecca struck gold, or, if not gold, something that at least held the promise of a precious metal, a shining glint of a vein. Hi, my name is Bradley, and I've just moved out to the New Jersey area from Los Angeles, where I worked at entertainment law. Don't hate me. I took a pay cut for my new job as a corporate consultant on copyright law, but the decrease in my cost of living makes up for it, and my hours are better. However, I don't know many people here, and I'd like to meet someone new. In my free time, I like to go biking. 25 miles on a temperate spring day is not unusual for me. I also like board games. My Scrabble scores come in at around 325 to 350, and I'm playing seriously and sticking to the official dictionary. <laughs> my chess ELO rating is around 1600, which isn't too shabby. I'd like to invite you to check out my profile. Let's talk if you like. You seem really cool and I'd love to hear from you. Okay, so there were some things about the note that were a little off. The information about taking a pay cut was, she supposed, meant to make him sound selfless, but it came off as self-congratulatory. And all the numbers gave the impression that he was maybe a little anal retentive. You got the idea that you'd be playing Scrabble one evening and he would lay down some bullshit two-letter word like za for 33 points. <laughs> and if he saw you roll your eyes, he'd throw a fit and say he really didn't think this relationship could continue. <laughs> and though he said he thought she was cool, he didn't say why. He gave no real sign that he'd even read her profile in the first place. This might be a batch message, like so many others. But it was so well written. It was amazing to her that she'd come so quickly to find proper grammar installing to be a turn on, so here she was. <laughs> And the message was polite, too. It didn't just seem that she wanted to screw. Maybe she just wanted to be friends. Maybe if it turned out that she had a chest rating around the same as his, as his he'd call it a win. She clicked the pulsing card at the top of the screen, and it quivered as a window sprang open with a text box for her reply to his message. Hey, Bradley, nice to e-meet you. I'm new here, too. I mean new to lovability, not new to New Jersey. I haven't been able to escape here and can't figure out why anyone would come here voluntarily. But maybe you'll, you'll be able to explain that to me. I have a confession to make. One of the proudest moments of my life was when I was able to play quadrant in a game against this guy and I covered two triple word score squares. Entertainment law, did you meet any famous people? I rode on a subway with Christopher Walken once in New York City. You would think he'd take cabs everywhere, but there he was, just like the rest of us. Everyone was trying to look like they weren't staring at him. Thanks for getting in touch. He wrote back within a few hours. His favorite Scrabble play, Sizzigy, with a blank for the third Y. His memorable, most memorable celebrity encounter, Marty with Bobby D. And after a flurry of emails during which they exchanged all manner of trivia about themselves, the first R-rated movies they'd seen, their favorite alcoholic drinks, their preferences in ethnic restaurants, they decided to just skip the intermediate step of talking on the phone and meet for a happy hour drink after Bradley got off, got off work on Wednesday. Bradley picked the place, a sports bar in Princeton, which wasn't the most intimate place for a conversation. It was baseball season, and Mets and Phillies games were blaring from the dozens of HD TVs in the place. But Rebecca figured that Bradley was a sporty kind of guy. He was probably planning in advance for the opportunity to flick his gaze over her shoulder occasionally to check a score. And indeed, when he showed up, the first thing he said, before he even greeted her, was that games in City Field were a lot more interesting since they moved the left field wall 12 feet closer to the plate. It's nice to meet you finally, Rebecca said as Bradley seated himself at the bar, no kiss, no hug, and loosened the knot of his tie. 
She tried to reconcile the breathing, living man in front of her with the pictures of him she'd seen online in the text and emails he'd sent. The rumpled lines of his suit disguised the shape of his body, but she suspected from the stubble of his hairline, which sat farther in the back of his head than she'd expected, that the shot of him on, on his profile page had been taken a few years ago at the beginning of the end of his prime. <laughs> Guess how old I am, Bradley said, as if he'd noticed her quick glance at his forehead. Go ahead. His profile had said he was 28. She figured 34, though he looked a little older. The lines around his edge eyes suggested time spent in the sun. Well, you said in your profile that you were 28, she said. That was maybe a bit of a lie. <laughs> she pretended to mull it over. 30? 34, Bradley said gleefully. <laughs> but I don't look like it. That's the crappy thing about these dating sites. They make age into nothing but a number, and they penalize you for having good genes and aging well. If I don't look 34, I shouldn't have to say I'm 34, at least at first. When I'm 60, I'm going to look 40. <laughs> he placed his hand on hers. It was a little cold, but she repressed a flinch. That was the only lie I told on my profile, and I just confessed to it. The rest of the data I provided you with is correct. Total honesty from here on out. She forced a laugh. Everybody lies a little, she said. Over the next half hour, as she nursed her gin and tonic while Bradley drained his Miller light, Rebecca would have ample cause to reflect on the slight strangeness of what he'd said. The rest of the data I provided you with is correct. Bradley was a man made out of numbers. Nearly every sentence out of his mouth bespoke his belief in the quantifiable life. He talked about how his move to New Jersey from LA had shortened his commute. 43 minutes to 11 on average, so 32 minutes each way times two, 64 minutes. A little over an hour a day, five hours a week. You can do a lot with five hours. He went on about his change in income, though in a concession to tax. He spoke in terms of percentages gained and lost rather than absolute values. When they made the offer, I did the math and saw I'd see a drop in income of 28%, but my expenditures could easily drop by 35% and I'd be able to maintain roughly the same standard of living. My apartment square footage is actually slightly larger, in fact. It's time to transition to more intimate subjects of discussion, Bradley announced, <laughs> as soon as the bartender brought a second beer. And though said subjects of discussion were, Rebecca supposed, nominally more intimate, they were still primarily data-driven. <laughs> he describes his eating habits. If I come in above 2,200 calories by the end of the day, I feel like crap the next morning. Miller Lite, 128. With gin and tonic, you're probably rating up around 200, by the way, depending on the pour. It's not the booze you have to watch out for, but the sugar. <laughs> Oddly, he mentioned his success on lovability. It's trending upward, though it's not the level it was when I was on the sites in LA. When I first joined, I averaged between zero and one date in a given week. Now it's up to, to between one and two, closer to two. Even more oddly, he related a st statistic he'd heard that he found surprising that 90% of American adults got cold sores. <laughs> it's amazing that, given its prevalence, people treat oral herpes as such a scandalous thing. <laughs> if you get to a certain age and you've lived an active socialized life, it's a practical inevitability. As Rebecca's opinion about Bradley shifted from amusement to boredom to active distaste, <laughs> his, her responses to his statistical declamations decayed from curt mm -hmm's to silent nods to blank indifference. Bradley responded by pulling an iPad from his briefcase, loading up a Scrabble app, and placing the tablet in front of her without a word. They played a quick clank game, and he cleaned her clock, 3.30 to 175. You need to learn how to count tiles so you don't make mistakes like that, he said near the end of the match, his tone more in sorrow than anger. <laughs> then he settled the bill, they shook hands, awkward, and parted in silence. Late that night, Rebecca received a message from Bradley that was a hell of a thing. Dear Rebecca, you may have picked up on my growing disappointment with you this afternoon <laughs> as our first meeting progressed. I have to say that though you seem quite personable in your electronic communications, in person your behavior is a little lacking in some of the traits that would let you get from a first to a second date with regularity. If lovability had a rating system, I would award you two and a half out of five stars. <laughs> However, if it used a scale that only allowed for integral values, I would unfortunately be forced to round down to two. Here are some suggestions for what you could do to improve the initial impression you make. 
I hope you take this constructive criticism in the manner in which it is intended. <laughs> One, vary your responses to inquiries. When our conversation began, you seemed quite cheerful and animated, but as it progressed, you became much less so. I asked you a series of questions that were intended to give you opportunities to reveal more about yourself, but you offered only binary answers and then troublingly, no answers at all. <laughs> if you want to, your date to go well, you need to display more interest. Two, direct the flow of conversation. Dialogue is collaborative. One consequence of your reticence was that I was forced to propose all of the topics of discussion, both before and after the transition to more personal subjects. If you contribute topics of your own, then it will make you appear more engaged. You should aim to bring up one new subject for everyone introduced by your date. Three, take control of the path of the date. If you want the initial meeting to extend beyond the planned drinks, there are many ways you can go about doing this. You can directly say, for instance, so I wasn't thinking about this when you showed up, but do you have any plans for dinner? I'm starving, I could really go for some pad thai. Or you can make a big, vague, or more general statement such as, after this, I'm up for whatever, or, hey, I don't really want to go home yet, Bradley, I'm having a lot of fun. Again, this comes down to a general lack of engagement on your part. Without your feedback, I was left to offer a game of Scrabble, which was not best, the best way to end the meeting. Four, don't lie about your ability in Scrabble. <laughs> I won't go in an, into an analysis of your strategic and tactical errors here, in the interest of brevity, but your amateurist playing style was quite evident. Now, despite my reservations as expressed above, I really do feel that we had some chemistry. <laughs> so I'd like to give things another chance. Would you respond to this message within the next three days with a su suggestion of a place you'd like us to visit together or an activity that you believe we would both enjoy? I would be forced to construe a delay of more than three days as an unfortunate sign of indifference. I hope to hear from you soon. Best, Bradley. Well, after reading through the whole missive again, the better to get herself good and angry, she poured herself a glass of Chardonnay and prepared to spend about an hour composing a message that would really tell this guy off point by point, because holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> but then, once she opened the text box and began to type, she looked at the wall of words she was replying to and opted instead for cut five quick keystrokes of NetSpeak, TL semicolon DR. Too long, didn't read. She fired off the message, belted back half the glass, and shut her laptop. Jesus fuck, human beings. <laughs> All right, thank you. Never lie about Scrabble. Yeah. <laughs> he, he's right about the Scrabble. <laughs> mm. And then I kept thinking that she ends up with Philip, who is yeah. less weird. Yeah. But only a little bit Still, less weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah somewhat yeah. less weird. Somewhat less, less weird. antagonistically weird. Yes. Yeah. Char charming. <laughs> yeah. In this way, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Philip is very charming <laughs> yeah. at first. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. When I was doing the research for this part of the book, by the way, it was one thing that worked out was that women just like letting them look at their profiles, including the messages that men sent them. <laughs> and so I just had to just tweak them look just a little bit. <laughs> Not too terribly much. Did you actually try sort of using the site yourself? No, doing the, I Doing didn't. the classic no. pretending to be a woman on the site, see what happens? No, no. Oh, I did open, I did open a fake account. Okay. Her name was Hortense. <laughs> and I, I didn't actually contact anyone, but I just kind of, and I didn't post a picture because uh -huh. I thought that would be just, you know, that would be unethical. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it, it's not illegal. No, that's true. Hortense didn't, Hortense only got contacted like once or twice. Um, okay. But yeah. But she did look at other people's profiles with impunity. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, um... I loved the book. Uh, we, we have been talking about the book for the last last few days, on and off, uh, via Twitter. Um, and there's a, a huge amount of things to discuss about it. It's, it, it's enormously, uh, enormously exciting and strange and, and completely unlike your previous book, um, completely unlike really anything else I, I've, I've read recently. And 
I have not finished it yet. I am 90% of the way through it. I have not <laughs> finished it. I understand that, that things happen at the end. Um, so please don't spoil it. No spoilers. I, d I don't know how many people here have actually read the whole thing. I'm, I'm sure some people have, but I, I have not. Um, I'm, I'm this close to, to, to doing it. Um, but so there, there, there were a, a lot of things to talk about. It, it's um, uh, without wanting to, to slight it as a, as a novel of character. It's, it's a, a novel full of big ideas. It's, it's, a, a, it, it's science fictional in, in the sense that it's, it involves the classic thing that science fiction is, is supposed to do, and, and or at least you know, when, when, when people are, are talking up the genre, they say it does, and I don't know that it always does, but, but the, 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 the taking of scientific advances and extrapolating them into the future and, and thinking about what that will do to society and what that will do to, to the way people live. Um, and so the, the, there's the thing that, that struck me reading it is, is the huge role of, of social media and big data and the way you, you extrapolate that forward and the way, way you, you think about what that's going to do to people. And, and um, I kept thinking of I, I, I found myself thinking, looking for comparisons, that the thing that popped into my mind was, was infinite jest. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that I kept thinking about was, um, there's, there's an essay that David Foster Wallace wrote, a very famous essay that he wrote 30, 40 years ago now about how, how challenging it is to write people, young people of his generation then, they'd be in their 50s mm -hmm. now, um, because people don't do novelistic things anymore, they don't do the things that people used to do in novels. Instead, yeah. young people don't talk to each other, they sit in a room and they watch the television, they, they look ahead at the television and they talk to the television mm. during breaks, or they talk about the television to the television um, with other people in the same room. And, and you, I keep hearing that, that, that it's, it's incredibly difficult to think about how to write novels where you, you can't write a contemporary novel or a near future novel without, and certainly not a, a science fictional novel, without thinking about the role of social media mm -hmm. and the fact that people are on their phones all the time. Yeah. And how you write, how you write characters who are not doing a lot of the sort of novelist in, novelistic interactions that they used to have. Instead, they, they communicate with each other's Facebook profiles. So mm -hmm. everything is a one remove. Yeah, um, and that one remove involves like sort of a bit of bit of performance, right? Actually, right. Uh, and uh, and I, one of the things you're talking about on on Twitter is that, um, and this gets in the big data issue is that all of these or many of these social media online communications have sort of like this this invisible per third party that has its own sort of best interest at heart mm -hmm. that's collecting data and sort of. Assemb you know, assembling it and, and doing things like say just serving you ads based on what kind of person it thinks you are, um, which is different from like when people just sort of talked on the telephone or, or talked in person or something like that. And one of the questions I'm sort of interested in is like, does the presence of that third party on Facebook sort of bend the way that we like sort of portray ourselves? Mm -hmm. um, are we trying to be the person? that Facebook wants us to be, or <laughs> something like that. Well, um, and, and I thought about that as I was listening to that excerpt with, with um, I mean, mostly I assume Brad is talking about his lovability statistics because he's a jerk. Yeah. But, <laughs> and he'd probably be doing that anyway because he's, he's that kind of person. But mm -hmm. the, 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 the nature of the social interaction is structured by the technology you're doing it through, and... I assume, I mean, lovability provides you with this data, mm. I assume. Yeah. Um, and that does affect the way you think. I mean, the, 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 if you spend a lot of time on Twitter, you do start becoming, tw Twitter gamifies chatting. Yeah. And it gives you constant little data points on how mm. well you're doing at mm. what used to be chatting. And now it's yeah. constantly, mm. the, the data is there. And I'm sure that does affect, yeah. you know, you, you have to, be aware of it, and that must affect you. Because with Twitter, you do actually know, like, with, if you look at the analytics page, you know, like, what the male-female ratio of your followers is, 
you know their you know their incomes. Yes, I have I know what percentage of people make who follow me make more than a hundred thousand dollars a year. I could watch mm -hmm. it change over time if I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Do they give you the change over time for income? I mean, I, I, you could write it down, I guess. <laughs> I guess you yeah. could, yeah. If you care that yeah. much, but yeah. But also, like, um, just worrying about whether or not someone someone's retweets what you say, mm -hmm. or whether it goes viral or not. If you get, oh you god, know. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the terrible dread when something is, is retweeted outside of your discourse community yeah. into, and it only takes maybe two or, you know. Yeah. I had this thing happen where, um, oh goodness, I, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about it, but I will, because. But what were you talking about Twitter? This yeah. is, it can't, it can't <laughs> get more embarrassing. No, I was, um, I was watching what this, this, this last Trump debate, or like one of the most recent ones, where one of his strategies is to, like when he gets booed a lot, he points at the at the uh, at the audience and says, "These are all party donors." Mm. And so the next day, I read this article that pointed out that, in fact, you know, these are all party donors. That the crowd has been like stacked, and, yeah. and so I just sort of posted this to you know posted this article on Twitter, and like a fair number of my Twitter followers are people who think that like Bernie Sanders isn't left enough, and so. <laughs> and so um, so it got retweeted by a liberal journalist, political journalist, and in turn it got retweeted by a political journalist for Slate, and in, return, and, and in turn it got retweeted by somebody who writes for the American Conservative. And then, like, my Twitter feed just filled up with Trump supporters, like, dang. <laughs> there, there may be some Trump supporters in the audience. You're all lovely, lovely people. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, but it was, it was, and I ended up getting, like, I think 25 or 30 Twitter followers who, like, were just, like, Trump USA and things like that. Maybe some of them were bots. I don't know. And so, some of them so left after yeah. about a day. But, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. It's a weird experience. I mean, I and I guess you could say that that sort of discourse is healthy, but and that it introduces you to people whose point of view you wouldn't normally consider. But that seems, yeah, I didn't believe that when I said it. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 healthy and it's unhealthy. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think we know yet. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly it's it's not something that was possible 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but so the, so the lovability bit that you read, that is now, right? Yeah. So that, that, that's happening basically now and then some indefinable period in the future that is roughly a generation away. Yeah. Uh, a generation in, I guess, internet terms. A generation because, in internet right. terms, yeah. Because yeah. one of the things that, you know, that, you know, a generation in terms of computer or communication evolution now, like, five, six, seven years maybe, something like that. Um, I don't use Instagram, which makes me feel like just old. <laughs> <laughs> I, the, the, the college students on, on the Princeton, Princeton campus use Yik Yak, which I haven't even looked at once, but like, you and the, do you use Yik Yak? I love Yik Yak. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> mm. Okay. Yes, I'm on Twitter. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. So these social media phenomena might sort of come and go, and you know they, and I guess like there are people who like have clear memories of what Friendster or mm -hmm. MySpace was, right. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was sort of, uh, as we were talking about before, I was a little bit vague about what near future social media was like because I would most likely be proven wrong, which is, you know, the problem of writing a novel that's set in the near future. Um, and in fact, one of the things that, the issues I had with writing this book as opposed to my first novel, which was set in an alternate history of the, of the 20th century, is that I'm not a terribly fast writer. My editor's here. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so I, I started this in, in 2008 when self-driving cars seemed like just weirdly, like crazily futuristic. And then they started to become like, you know, kind of a, a viable thing. And in fact, 
I think it was in, in 2015 when, uh, like if you had a particular model of Tesla, you got this software update that suddenly allowed it to like drive by itself on highways and things like that. And so I kept sort of wondering, you know, sort of fearing that but time, between the period when I finished the book and the period that it appeared on shelves, like some major historical event would happen. <laughs> <laughs> so the book would be dated like by, by the time it came out. And that didn't, that didn't quite happen. Um, I mean, the one thing that, that kind of came close was uh, uh, there's a fair amount of this book, well, a couple chapters set in the 1990s that are about the history of gravitational wave research. And when I started on this in 2008, like nobody ever thought that we would ever discover gravitational or directly observe gravitational waves. And even when I turned it in, in like in 2015, I, I just kept checking with physicists and I asked, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I asked two, one of whom you know, worked on gravity wave research like earlier in her career and another one who works on dark matter. And I, and I said, is this gonna happen? And, and they said, it, it, if it happens, it's gonna be like kind of, like before the end of the decade, like close to the end of the decade, but it is going to happen. And so I revised like that page and left it like kind of vague. And so even now it's still like kind of reads okay. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody expected that, you know, between like July 2015 and February 2016, that they would discover these things and then like get a paper out and then make a press release and then just like have this whole thing go on. So, so yeah. You know, it kind of, I mean, it, it, it added to, because obviously I, I, I was reading that with the news of gravitational waves, you know, playing mm -hmm. on the next screen while I had it. And, and um, mm -hmm. so on the one hand, those chapters are sort of a story of bitter failure yeah <laughs> and it kind it's kind of a good extra twist of the knife to see that actually no you know there really is the success right now in the real world it, mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite odd on on and on the other hand it's also i felt you were using that as, as we were saying upstairs I, I felt you were using that as as a the ultimate scientific discovery that you can't ever know that you've yeah. really made it you can't ever be absolutely certain because you, you 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 can't I, I still don't. I mean, I, I read that we have now directly observed gravitational waves, and I still do not understand what that means. Um, certainly, uh, most of what I know about gravitational waves, I actually know from reading your book, because I haven't <laughs> read the articles; I only read the headlines. Um, but it does seem to be that 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 classic example of, of a scientific phenomenon, where, where of course you're, you're not directly observing the thing itself; you're observing the measurements and the measurements and the measurements at, at many stages of removal. You don't know; you never know. Um, but then it turns out we do know. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. sorry. Yeah, so, so there was this, um, so, so, I mean, and, and this goes to the question about, like, of, of failure in science, because, uh, again, back in 2008 when I started doing the, like, the initial, like, sort of passes at this, I was at a party with some astrophysicists, because it's Princeton, and that's what happens. <laughs> and, um, and I was talking to one, and I, and I said, so I'm working on this, this novel about um, about uh, a woman who's married to an experimental physicist, and and he said, "I hope it's not science fiction." <laughs> and, <laughs> and and so I ended up um, over the course of like writing the book, I, I ended up having like these both formal and informal conversations with scientists because I wanted to get not, not just like the actual details of the of the science right, but the social behavior of scientists and. Uh, and a few times I would I would ask them, you know, like, why don't you like science fiction? Because it was clear that they didn't like it. And it wasn't like sort of like the general, like sort of uninformed distaste of like, you know, I don't like things with people shooting lasers at each other. It was like, a, it was like an informed dislike. And, <laughs> and so w finally, like one friend of mine said to me that part of the problem for her with science fiction is that science always works in it. That either it starts with an experiment and then the experiment turns out and you see like what the success is or what the results are. Or it takes place in like this future where like some scientific research has been done and we see its impact on, on society. 
And so I, I said, what if we have a story where, like somebody's working on a scientific experiment and they beat their heads against the wall like time and time again, and then they run out of funding and then like they come up for tenure review and they don't get tenure and then they end up driving a cab. And she said, that's not science fiction, that's just like a thing that happens. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was, but I, so I ended up becoming interested in like sort of the psychological frame of mind that it takes to, you know, to do this kind of thing that involves like just beating your head, head against the wall like day after day. Um, like one, there was another another physicist I talked to, and uh, I asked her like, why do you? Um, my first sort of general question to her was like, why do you do physics? And she gave me like this general kind of very optimistic thing about like, the pleasure of finding things out and stuff like that. And then I said, so what's your day like at work? And I said, and then she said, well, I get to work about nine o'clock and then I screw up all day. <laughs> and, and so that that tension is very interesting to me as you know and that makes for a different character than like the kind of physicist you often see in science mm -hmm. fiction who is like the embodiment of an idea and who's also like kind of a hero right, I guess, right. You know, yeah my, my, my wife is a, a bioinformatician um, mm -hmm. who, who got her PhD just recently and, and um, so I, I I've seen her daily routine in the lab and I I, you know, I, I know those people and it it rang very true <laughs> because <laughs> it, it is. I mean, you, see, you, you see people. So the the the, 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 the day-in, day-out work involves an enormous amount of, of updating the spreadsheets mm -hmm. and <laughs> updating the code that updates the spreadsheets. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's endlessly updating the code, mm -hmm. um, and and the, the 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 phenomenon of endlessly being unsure. That that was yeah. what struck struck me about the book, and that and that, that seemed true to life. That that. In science fiction, even if there's a failure, you know there's a failure because it's a spectacular physical failure. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, if, if something goes wrong in, in classic science fiction, it's usually an explosion. Right. Uh, so you, you know that they blew up the world or they released a dinosaur into the city or something. It's, it's, it's a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. um, but there isn't that same phenomenon of, well, you know, you, you, you've got slightly more significant results mm -hmm. in in the statistical significance sense yeah which is to say you have no idea whether you've got something that's actually really you know, you've really found something or whether you've just messed around with the data to the point where it looks like you have that 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 mm -hmm. phenomenon of yeah. um, just uncertainty mm -hmm. which I suppose brings us to time travel oh yeah because <laughs> <laughs> why time travel Oh, jeez, God, why? <laughs> I've asked myself that same question. <laughs> no, um... Or almost uh, time travel. Yeah, or, or almost time yeah. travel, I guess. Um, it's, uh... One of the things that, uh... I mean, it's, I, I, I don't know how to answer this question without, like, kind of spoiling something. But, okay, but, so, one of the... One of the things that the the characters like are trying to figure out is like if time travel worked how would it work and there are certain sort of possibilities that are floated over the course of the book and then like one that seems like kind of perhaps more certain than others but we never it's it's open to judgment as to whether we're actually really sure about how these things work whereas mostly usually in time travel fiction or the stuff that I've read, there's like a very clear idea. It's like the one idea, or something like that. Right. Or there's something like that's that's openly, like kind of fantastic, where the where the mechanism isn't really explained at all. Mm -hmm. Like sort of like this is the Doctor Who solution. But um, I did. So I, I was kind of interested in doing, like, is it possible to to do it write time travel fiction that's set in the real world that doesn't look weird. Mm -hmm. Or that doesn't like stand out for its own sort of falseness or something like that. It doesn't right. seem like a fantasy, right? Um, so that's I think that's I think that's one possible thing that drew me to it. But also because I could have like with the way that I ended up sort of addressing it, it allowed me to think about that sort of that sense of failure and uncertainty mm -hmm. in science. Well, and and 
without spoiling as far as I've got, I mean, it, it, you, you seem to use the, the idea of time travel. A, a, any time travel story has, has to get into uh, the questions of, of what happens if you go back, and you know, what happens if you go back in time, does, does, does that change the future? Mm -hmm. um, that sense of, of the vague unreality of the world in a world in which this is possible, once you start thinking about this, that that, I mean, that, that that's very powerfully throughout the whole book, this sense that, that things are not quite right, and the, I, mean, I think mm -hmm. on your very first page, Rebecca is anxious because the world doesn't seem quite right. Mm -hmm. um, and that seemed to fit in very much with the uh, all the stuff about data-driven changes to society yeah. and, and, and the fact that you, 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 you start your timeline in the breakdown of capitalism following the recession. Yeah, it's yeah. A, the, 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 the whole sense that something is, is slightly broken in a way that's really hard to put your finger on. Mm -hmm. And time travel is, is I mean, it, it forces you to think about that and, and it's also, as I was saying the other day, but, but, but time travel is, is the... It's usually in science fiction, it, it, it comes with a lot of clear rules, mm -hmm. but they don't make sense. They never make sense. It's, it, it's the great science fiction trope where it's not clear that it even makes sense. Mm -hmm. And nothing else. You know, spaceships, they may or may not work, but at least we know what a spaceship is. But time travel, we just don't know whether it even makes sense to even think that there is such a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and Cause, and also going back to the, I guess the the, the unreality thing, and, and again, and again, this might just be like the people I follow on Twitter, but especially yeah. today, of like you know, there seem to be like sort of regular, regular jokes about like how, you know, is this the timeline that we're actually in, <laughs> <laughs> and some sort of like active war, <laughs> and because like you know, like again, if if I turned in like a, a manuscript, like say a year ago, that described like this particular political situation it would be it would seem kind of silly oh yeah, it's, yeah. It's, 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 it is silly yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really not plausible um. Um, but yeah but so and, and I don't know if um, again, if social media can, contributes to that sense of that you know of, of not quite rightness a way in which sort of our public self lines mm -hmm. up with our private self a bit less than, than it seemed to in the, like in the 20th century well, and our sense of the, of the world that we see is very different as well, and, and that, that gets back to the fact that you are now only two unfortunate retweets away from encountering all the Trump supporters. Yes. <laughs> all the Trump supporters in the world. That happened last night to somebody I know on Twitter, and it's mm -hmm. not good. You know, and that, that, that can happen, and, mm -hmm. and that wouldn't have happened in the same way a hundred years ago. We're not used to that. You know, a hundred right. years ago, you... you your, I would your have to drive somewhere. You'd have to drive somewhere. You'd, you'd have to really go out of your way to have that experience of being yelled at by hundreds of strangers. Um, and that, that's very strange. That's very disorienting. Yeah. You know, we're not used to, to mm -hmm. simultaneously having a, a, a community all around us that, that we've chosen that affirms all our self-belief and then it can just fall apart like that. A yeah. you know, hundred years ago you, you, you would hang out with your neighbours and there would be a set degree of disagreement that they would have with you. Mm -hmm. And you at least you would know where you would know where you stand, yeah. more or less, every day mm -hmm. as to how much you were going to get yelled at for being a weirdo, but now you yeah. don't know. Because mm -hmm. um. mm -hmm. one sort of an, one sort of character that I don't really have in this book is although it has, you know, it, it's got enough as it is, but um, like a character who's entirely post-internet mm -hmm. and and tr sees the world in that way with like no memory of what it was like when you couldn't just like ask a question right. into the air and then like and get an answer. Um, partly because I read it maybe because I'm I'm just maybe not quite one hundred percent sure what that's like, which is but we have like say like that's like an eighteen year old now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like an eighteen-year-old now, um, mm -hmm. but at least the eighteen-year-old is sort of vaguely aware that there's something prior to that. Right. I don't know. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe they're not, but I mean, they, they know on some mm -hmm. historical level that they're, yeah. that, that's happening. Um, I have a, a, I have small children, and I, I was explaining to my, my four-year-old the other day. Uh, he was absolutely blown away. 
he, he asked why the characters in Wizard of Oz didn't just get on the phone and call somebody to help. And I <laughs> that it was written in 1900 and there were no phones. And that just blew his mind. <laughs> and it's completely foreign to a four-year-old experience that, that, that all the data in the world is not just there. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, I don't know what that does to people. Yeah. But yeah, it, mm-hmm. I mean, in, in, in the book you, ha- you have... Um, you have children, but the children are seen through adult eyes and are quite unknowable. Yeah. Um, there's Harriet who thinks she's green, mm-hmm. and there's Sean who is yeah. strange. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, any general questions, or just hang out for a bit? Or... <laughs> Dexter, actually, would you talk a little about the, the blackout years? That was one of my favorite parts of the book. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to hear, you know, your inspiration for that. And it also, to me, it's interesting hearing this conversation because <clears throat> it dovetails with this, this sense of failure, right? Mm-hmm. That that is its own version of it. So if you yeah. might something interesting to talk about. So there's, so in the, in what would be the, I guess, like 2013 or so in, in the world of, of this book, the character Rebecca has like graduated from college and hasn't like found the job. And, and she's having the problem that millennials have. And so she has this period that she refers to as like the blackout season where she just sort of like wanders around town and feels like kind of a bit, I guess, lost about her whole personal experience. But then because, but as an effect of like this sort of wondering, she sees all these kind of weird intimate moments between people who are also like kind of wandering around town in the same like weird way, um, and she, when she finally meets Philip and you know who she ends up marrying, and they have this discussion about failure, um, one of the things that she says is that, or that she thinks but doesn't actually say, is that um, for certain kind of millennials, like failure is like a unnecessary default state. It's not like say if you got, yeah, you know, if you graduate from college in the 1980s or 1990s, then you're probably, you're largely kind of guaranteed like some kind of a job. Um, whereas it seems like I, I know like a fair number of people who are like, you know, in their like late 20s or 30s and, and who still like kind of live with their parents and are working like retail or something like that after having gotten like a, you know, like a bachelor's from a, from a good college and things like that. And so, when I was writing that, I was doing a lot of just kind of like wandering around town myself because that's how I that's how I write on days when I write. I just like kind of get a notebook and just like kind of drift around and like end up having like idle conversations with people. So there might be a lot, a little bit of that experience and Rebecca's experience as well. Yeah. I have a question, but I like how you compared having a profile to a marionette. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's not directly you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I got that idea when I was, well, when I was using Hortense. My, <laughs> my, my fake uh, woman who looked at men's profiles, who was of an indeterminate age. I think I went for one of like the, the funny bits. <laughs> I mean, very well chosen. Because, <laughs> because it's just like just because reading just like full on tragedy just doesn't. Buy my book. Thank you so much.